The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, I'm a little slow getting started today. Better get going. What we're going to talk about today is a technique. You guys done? OK, thanks. We're going to talk about it today is a technique known as modal analysis. And it's a way of analyzing things that vibrate, essentially thinking about the one mode at a time. Though you might not make a lot of use of the actual calculations, doing the math throughout your careers. I think if you understand it conceptually, it'll help you just have a better understanding of what vibration is all about. Just give you some insight to it that you otherwise wouldn't have. So the basic concept is that you can model just about any structural vibration as the summation of the individual contributions of each what we call natural mode. So what we mean by that is let's start by thinking, actually, let me say that this applies to both continuous systems like vibrating strings or beams or buildings as it does to finite degree of freedom rigid body systems. We've been, we haven't talked about continuous systems. I'll do a lecture on it as the last lecture of the term. It's kind of an enrichment sort of lecture. But everything I say about finite degree of freedom systems can be extended to continuous systems. But we'll, since we've been studying rigid bodies and systems with finite numbers of degrees of freedom, I'll explain, I'll go through this analysis in the context of rigid body, finite degree of freedom systems. So in general, we can write the equations of motion for finite degree of freedom systems as a mass matrix, and to keep the kind of writing down, I'm just going to underline matrices and a squiggle under vectors. So we have, a, in general, we can write the equations of motion. It's a mass matrix times a, an acceleration vector plus a damping matrix times a velocity vector, stiffness matrix times a displacement vector, all equal to some external vector of excitations. Now, I'm writing these as if these are translations, but you know, like from doing the cart, the pendulum on the cart problem, that the equations of motion might involve rotations and displacements, and we let them, you know, they mix together here, however they fall out. But it, just to write them symbolically, I'm just going to call them all, refer to all of those coordinates at, with an x vector. Okay. Now, the basic premise of modal analysis is a thing called the modal expansion theorem. And it's basically the assertion that you can represent any motion set of vectors I'll write them kind of as a vector here for a moment. Any set of, of motions, x, as the superposition of each contributing mode. Now, each mode has a mode shape to it, which I'm going to call u. And up here, I'll put a superscript for what mode it is. The first mode times its time-dependent behavior. And this is called what they call in textbooks, these are called the natural coordinates. And we'll see what those are in a second. So mode shape one, this is the time-dependent and amplitude part that says how much the contribution of mode one is to this motion and what its time dependence is. This is, and then you'd have mode two's contribution Q2, 
And this goes out to the nth modes contribution qn of t. And that's the proposition that you can represent the total response of the system as a superposition of the response of each of the natural modes of the system. And if it's an n degree of freedom system, there would be n natural modes. So Now, something I didn't say here is this is all, this all assumes that the system vibrates. So this is, this is all in the discussion of things that exhibit vibratory motion. So this is all, I should say here, a vibrating systems. So this is kind of a long and cumbersome way of writing this out. So if you notice, each one of these is the mode shape vector. And if I put them together in a matrix, it would look just side by side. Here's a u1 over 2 un, and multiply it by this vector q1 of t down to Qn. That's the same statement, but said in a much more compact way. So the statement is modal expansion theorem basically says the vector of these are your generalized coordinates. which we've been using all term long. These are the generalized coordinates that you choose to derive the equations of motion around. The vector of generalized coordinates can be written as u, q. And these are often called the modal coordinates, or sometimes called the natural coordinates. So if we can say that x is u, q, then x dot, you take the derivative of each one of those expressions, you'll find that's going to be u, q dot, and x double dot equals u, q double dot. Because these are just constants. The mode shape vectors are just a fixed set of numbers that represent the mode shapes of the system. Now, just to, uh, I think maybe this is a good time to do this. You grab one end. <clears throat> so this is a, and it's hard to see black against black. My apologies for that. But so this is a guitar string or, um, you know, any stringed instrument. Or in fact, any long, slender thing under tension will vibrate. And it has, if I do this carefully, that's called the first mode of vibration. And that's when you pluck your guitar string or violin in the middle. You mostly hear that. And, but at twice the frequency, if I can get it going here, there's a second mode of vibration. And for a taut string, it's a, it happens to be at twice the frequency of the first. And if I, my hand is well calibrated, it may be easier if it's a little longer. I get this going right. Ah, there's a third mode. Okay, so each that's what we that's what we're calling. Oh, what I meant to say when I was doing this is these shapes for the vibrating string. That second mode shape happens to be one full sine wave, and the mode shape has the form sine n pi x over l, where l's the length of the string, 
n's the mode number. So first mode, second mode is this when n is 2. First mode, n is 1. Nth mode or something high. You know, you get higher modes like that. So the, these are the mode shapes for a vibrating string. So that's, and this, that's good for now. This, this uh, two degree of freedom system with the two lump masses, and it's going to show up there, yeah. Okay, this is basically two lump masses, and we idealize the springs as being massless, but it's a pretty good approximation. This has two modes of vibration, and Professor Gossard made these neat little things that can make it so, and I'll, I'm going to come back to this, but there's mode one. And the mode shape is, as this goes down one unit, that goes down about two, two times as much. I'll give you the exact numbers in a minute. And the other mode shape of this system I do the right, in, if I give it the right initial, we're going to talk about this today and why this happens, but if I give it the right initial conditions, I can make it vibrate only in the second mode shape. And so it's now deflected with the right conditions so that it'll respond only in second mode. This mass goes up and down a lot. That mass goes up and down a little, opposite to it, actually. The frequency is different from the first. But if this is moving one unit, then this down here is moving minus 0.3 or something like that. And that ratio is constant. And that's the, called the mode shape. So if you just pick one of them and say, let its motion be one, then all of the other masses in the system will move in a particular ratio to the motion of that one that you arbitrarily set to one. So this will mean by mode shapes and their natural frequencies. There's the natural frequency associated with that first mode. And we can solve these things mathematically, and we've been doing that a little, uh, a little bit in the last couple of lectures. All right. <clears throat> so this is the relationship between these things, the generalized coordinates and the modal coordinates. And we now need to uh, See how we are going to use these. So in general, we have our equations of motion. And I'm going to substitute for x, x dot, and x double dot, these. So and pre multiply by u transpose. Remember, the transpose of a matrix, you just take the column, first column, make it the first row, second column, make it the second row. So if I plug in these up here, I get M U Q. I'm going to leave some space here because I'm going to pre-multiply in a second. Plus C U Q dot plus k u q equals the external exciting forces. Now I'm going to pre-multiply by u transpose. Okay. Now a remarkable thing happens. It happens that if you take, when you, when you do this calculation, when you multiply this matrix times that, one row at a time, so this has, this has vectors in it, 1 through n. I'm going to pick vector r, the rth one. If I take that rth vector and multiply it one at a time by row by row by row, then I get a new 
vector that results, which I'm going to multiply by this. And so if I'm going to, so, but I'm, I'm going to pick out one of the vectors multiplied through times one of the uh, rows here, which is all, the, when you transpose them, the rows are now the vectors. So I'm going to pick, if I do the calculation, lost my right piece of paper here. So if I just pull this, pull out one of these, one of the calculations that you end up doing as you do this whole triple matrix multiplication, um, there will, you need to know the following fact. So for mode, the mode S transpose, that's one of the rows out of here, <coughs> times M times one of the columns, the rth one, from here, and I do this calculation, this is 0 for r not equal to s. What that statement says is the only non-zero result from this is, the, is when you multiply, when you take the rth column from here and you use the rth row from here. All the other combinations of this thing go to zero. And the net result of that is that this implies that u transpose m u always equals to a diagonal vector, which I'll call this like that. Sometimes a mass matrix is diagonal to start with. But even if it isn't, you do this calculation, it will produce a diagonal matrix. And that's because this is, this, these multiplications are always 0, unless r is the same as s. And the same is true for u transpose k, u, will give you a, a k matrix that is diagonal. And you know, normally so when the stiffest matrix we've come up with, they've generally not been, they've generally been full matrices oftentimes. But you do u, k, u, k, u, you will get a diagonal stiffness matrix. And the problem, there's a little problem comes because u transpose c, u. Well, sometimes. This one is diagonal only for ideal conditions of damping. So we're going to have, that's something you just have to address. So only for ideal conditions, and that's just something you have to deal with. So this, why is this? Why is this got, you know, why is there this special wonderful thing? The, the natural modes of a system, this one is a two degree of freedom system, form a complete and independent set of vectors. And in this case of this two degree of freedom system, I can pick any, any, allow, any kinematically allowable position like this. Stationary, static is, ob static is one of the solutions, right, to this two degree freedom system. So any, any possible allowable position of these two things, static or moving, can be described by a linear combination of the mode shapes of the system, a weighted sum of the mode shapes of the system. And that's all it takes. So this one has two mode shapes, you know, one that looks kind of like that, one that looks like this one's going down, this one's going up. There are particular ratios. And I can take a weighted amount of that first mode, so much of it, and a weighted amount of the second mode, and add them together and describe any possible position of the system. 
The same thing is true of that string. It has mode shapes that are sine waves, but they you know, sine 1 pi x, sine 2 pi x over L, and so forth. Any possible linear, any possible allowable shape of that guitar string can be made up of a weighted sum of the mode shapes of the system. And moreover, the mode shapes, the reason this works is because the mode shapes are orthogonal to one another. Now you know that if you take uh, two sine waves, like that string, and you, and you take sine, first mode, sine pi x over L, and the second mode, say sine 2 pi x over L, and you multiply them together and integrate from 0 to L, what do you get? You always get 0 if, if the two signs are, if they're full wavelengths, they go to nodes at the end. You will always get 0 if the wavelengths are different. Always. Right? That's a statement of orthogonality of sine functions. The same thing is true of these simple vectors. They're orthogonal to one another such that if you do this multiplication, you transpose mu, you only get contributions when you are using mode r, transpose m mode r. You only get a contribution from each of those that gives you the diagonals. The same is true when you do u transpose ku. Because of orthogonality, you only get a diagonal matrix at the end. And under the right conditions, U transpose CU gives you a diagonal matrix. So what's that good for? Well, here was the set of equations that we get when we make that substitution. This is going to give us A diagonal mass matrix times Q double dot plus, when the conditions are right, a diagonal damping matrix times Q dot plus a diagonal stiffness matrix times Q equals U transpose F, which so vector times a matrix gives you back a vector, which we call capital Q. It's a function of time, and this is called the modal force. But if you look carefully at these, if I pick the rth one, mode, mode r out of this whole thing, so the, or, or if I just pick any mode out of this, any part of this vector, and complete this multiplication, I will find that I get an MR, which is the rth entry here. And now to, sh to I'm going to refer to these as the modal masses, and I'll write them as capitals, and I'll give a subscript to tell you what the mode is. This is a number. This is the modal mass from mode R. This gives me an equation that looks like MRQR double dot plus CRQR dot plus KRQR equals QR of T. And what does that remind you of? That we've done a lot of work with. What, how many degree of freedom system? It looks, that's the equation of motion, the generic equation of motion of a single degree of freedom oscillator. And you know how to calculate the response to initial conditions for that. You know how to calculate the steady state response for that when you have a harmonic input, right? When I said at the beginning of the, beginning of the, beginning of the discussion about vibration is it's really important to understand the single degree of freedom oscillator because it gives you, it'll give you insight as to the behavior of complicated multiple degree of freedom systems. And here's, here's the, the proof of this. Any this is now n uncoupled single degree of freedom systems. This is n independent single one degree of freedom 
systems, which you can solve one at a time. Now, lots of times, a vibrating system, a complicated one, might be this thing. If I hit this, it's vibrating. And actually, it's pretty much vibrating at a single frequency. And are there any, once I've hit it, are there any external forces driving it? So what kind of response are you seeing? Response to? Initial conditions, right? Now, in general, each one of the natural modes of a system has a different natural frequency, right? So if I hit this thing and I look at it, you know, it, it really, I can just see it wiggling back and forth and basically at one frequency. So if you wanted to come up with a simple model of this system, how many natural modes do you think you'd have to include to describe the motion of this system? One. Now, is that a lot easier than having to do the full general equation of motion for all the possible modes that this thing has? And it turns out you know, a lot, right? You have to deal with the equation of motion of a single degree of freedom system to describe this. And that's the real point. You know, they built the Hancock building across the river 35 years ago, was losing windows like crazy. It was a brand new building. And the windows, when the wind would get above 40 miles an hour, the windows started falling out. 60 stories high, 60, 61 stories high. And the wind was blowing. Where do you suppose the windows fall out? What part of the building? Huh? I mean, you'd think the wind, wind is blowing. It gets stronger as it goes up. It's probably blowing out the windows at the top, right? But the windows were breaking. As, you, you, as time went by, every time the window would break, they would they replace this five foot by nine foot sheet of glass with a piece of plywood. And so you got this statistical sampling after a while of where the breakage was. So you had no windows broken at the top. And a few as you got further down, and more, and lots of them broken out at the bottom. It turns out that that building was vibrating in its, most, mostly in its first bending mode. It was going back and forth like this. Also happened to have a torsional mode. Its first torsional mode was kind of twisting around the base like that. So in fact, this motion, the motion when, when it get about 40 miles an hour, the building would start rocking and rolling. Mostly like this with a little of this thrown in. Okay. And, but you can basically model that complicated building that has millions of possible natural <laughs> modes in it by one or possibly two single degree of freedom oscillators. So that's the power of modal analysis. But I think the real power of understanding that you can do this is that it gives you this immediate insight as to what might be going on in something. So I look at this. I don't, I don't see a complicated thing that I have to model with a big finite element model. I see something that's vibrating at one frequency, and I can... I know it has a, it'll decay, it'll have damping, it'll have a natural frequency, and I get immediate insight as to its behavior by knowing this. Okay, and that's the real reason why I wanted to show this to you. So today, we, I want, we'll do, um, there's sort of two things, two, play, two directions we can go with this. One is to talk about response to initial conditions. And the other is to talk about the response to force excitation. So let's, we're going to begin by doing response to ICs. Okay. And then we'll move on probably next time and talk about response to harmonic excitations. And, uh, bef so bef and we're going to use that as the example. Before I go there, how, uh, once we have broken the system down and analyzed it this way, how do we get back to the motion of the system in our generalized coordinates, which are the ones we're comfortable with? Because I don't know how to take, where to take a ruler and go measure, you know, measure this natural coordinate. So somehow I have to get back to putting into real physical measurements that I know how, that I can relate to. Well, that's easy because it's where, where did we start with this? We started by saying this whole thing began right here.
And so at the end, you, we, we just come back and say, oh, well, x here, our generalized coordinates, is this summation of the mode shapes u, i here, summed, summed over i of q, i of t. Now, the reason I wrote it here as a summation is to, to, you, is to remind you that you do this That's the beauty of this thing, is you only have to do it over the modes that matter. Or, so if you've decided to approximate the motion of this complica complicated system by just a couple of modal contributions, because you know they're the important ones, this, this is a pretty short summation. This is how you get back to your original modal coordinates, is take the modal amplitude, multiply it by the mode shape, and when you do that, it says, you know, if this turns out to be, say, some a sine omega t. When you multiply it by the mode shape, it basically tells you how much each generalized coordinate gets of the motion. The mode shape distributes the answer out proportionally in the correct amount. So this is how you get back to the original. So let's think about that system. And we'll do an initial conditions kind of problem. So I think Professor Gossard, you, I think in class you sort of figured out what the approximate k's and m's and things were for that system. So I actually took it apart, weighed it, measured some natural frequencies, and have come up with a pretty good model, or at least pretty good set of numbers characterizing this two-degree freedom system. C1, K1, M1, K2, C2, X1, X2. So these are my generalized coordinates measured probably from what position? <coughs> static equilibrium, right? So I don't have to mess with gravity in this. Measured from static equilibrium. And to try to help keep things understandable, try, I've, write, I've tried to write the parameters of the system as lowercase k1s, k2s, k3s, because I want to write modal stiffness for mode 1 as a capital K1. So I'll try to be consistent about that. And notice where I put the dampers in the system. That's because most of the damping in this thing comes from the upper mass rubs against a stationary object. And the lower, which is the, the, the bar here, the lower mass rubs against the stationary object. So it's as if I'm going to model that as a dash pot between each mass and the fixed reference frame, because the, the bar doesn't move. So it's an approximate model of the damping. And so if we do our sum of forces on each of these masses, just do Newton's law on the mass, uh, we can come up with it, our two equations of motion. We get two equations of motion. And let's see. I think I'll give you some information here first. M1. So those, and I really don't know the damping, but we can get that by counting how many cycles it takes to decay and so forth. So that's basically what I go, come into this problem knowing. And now I'm going to write my equations of motion as, in matrix form. So 
it's going to end up looking like M1 Now notice the damping in this one, the damping force is only proportion, it'll be C1, X1 dot, had nothing, doesn't involve the motion of the other object. And this one, the damping force, only involves the second motion. So this, ha this one happens to look like a C1, 0, C2. And the stiffness matrix. Well, it's K1 plus K2 minus K2 minus K2 and K2. X1, X2. And for no external forces, this starts off. This one is a, has no external, and nothing on the right-hand side. It's equal to 0. So those are my equations of motion. And you know if you multiply these out, you get two equations. And each one would be is a result that you get by applying Newton's law to mass one and Newton's law to mass two. But you, we've done that enough times. I'm not going to go through that, that part of it. OK. And putting in real numbers. That's our mass matrix. I don't know this. My stiffness matrix. This is my K matrix here. <clears throat> and stiffness matrices, they're always symmetric. Damping, da although this one happens to be diagonal, you'll find that mass matrices and even the damping matrices for our linear systems are symmetric. So here's my stiffness matrix, here's my mass matrix. Okay. So now I want to do, and also, in this case, here's my damping matrix. But I'm going to leave that because it's the one that's a little bit troublesome. <clears throat> so what do I need to do to this to uh, carry out my modal analysis? So I need to go find the results of computing U transpose M and U, U and U transpose KU. And let's see what we get. So we need to know a couple of things about this system. We need to know the natural frequencies and mode shapes. So if we have this mass matrix and we have the stiffness matrix, then we know we can cast this. We want the undamped natural frequencies and our mode shapes. We know that we can transform the equations, we have the equations of motion into an algebraic problem where we solve for the natural frequencies and mode shapes. So we have, uh, just to kind of re remind you really quickly of that, remember our equations look like this, undamped. And you assume that x is some form u, in fact e to the i omega t, you plug it in, you get minus 
omega squared m plus k u e to the i omega t equals 0. And this now is your algebraic problem. Either this unknown set of amplitudes is 0, what these are going to turn out to be the mode shapes. And they're not generally 0, so that means this has to be 0. So that means we know the determinant of this matrix And that'll give you the, nat in this case, the two natural frequencies. This gives you the omega n's of the system. The omega n squared is what you solve for. Okay, and then you go back and you get the um, the mode shapes out of it. And but this you can do on the computer too. You can either crank out the quad. This gives you a, for a two degree freedom system. This gives you a quadratic, you know, omega squared. You solve it. You plug it back in and get the mode shapes. I'm not going to take the time to do that today because I want to do emphasize the modal analysis part. So I'll give you the answers. Where are we here? So you get omega one. It's five point six five. Four, six, and I seem to be keeping a lot of a lot of significant digits, and there's a reason for that. One of the reasons you need in both mode shapes and natural frequencies, you need to carry a lot of significant digits, or modal analysis doesn't work. Or at least you don't get the clean results you expect. If you're sloppy, about the number of significant digits and you compute u transpose mu, the off-diagonal terms won't quite go to zero. And it's just because you're not carrying enough precision. OK. Now that's the two uh, natural frequencies. And now the u matrix, the mode shapes for this system that goes with that, u comes out to be 1.0 and 2.2667. And that's mode. I'll do this to help you. It's, it's the columns are the mode shapes. That's the first mode shape. And the second mode shape is 1 and minus 0 0.2236. So that's your mode. So those are the mode shapes for the first and second mode that go with these two natural frequencies. So that's for this system. The top one moves one unit. The bottom one moves 2.27 times that. The same direction, positive, positive. The upper one moves one unit. The bottom one moves the opposite direction. That's the minus sign. It's equivalent to a phase angle of 180 degrees, minus 22% of the amount that the upper one moves. So first one moves. One unit, the bottom one moves 2.2 times that. And in the second mode, which is much harder to get going. I guess the only way I can do it is to do it the way Professor Gossard intended here. One unit up and down, minus 0 0.2236 going the opposite way. So those are our mode shapes. These are the natural frequencies. I calculated this one and measured it with a stopwatch. This one I can do watching it with a stopwatch. And I came within less, better than 1% to get in the same number. OK. So I carry, I want my modal mass matrix. I carry out this calculation. And for this system, remember it's going to give me back a diagonal matrix looking like this. And in fact, the numbers are 3.556200 and 0.35. 
zero eight. And when I can calculate U transpose K U gives me a diagonal stiffness matrix. And I get the numbers one one three point seven one and zero zero one zero nine point eight three nine. And that's my diagonal diagonalized stiffness matrix. Now something had better be true. I'm saying that this is now, this is now going to give me my two independent single degree freedom equations of motion, right? So I'm looking for So what I'm seeking here, I want to get two equations, one that looks like m1 q1 double dot plus c1 q1 dot plus k1 q1 equals 0 for no external force. That's one of the equations I'm after. And the other one, it looked like m2 q2 double dot plus c2 q2 dot k2 q2. Now, one way to check that you've gotten the right thing is now these are independent, two independent single degree freedom systems. What's the natural frequency of this system? Mm, yeah. Actually, I heard somebody say square root of k1 over m1. That had better be true. But what numerically, what's the number? What did it better be? It better be the omega-1 of the system, right? And so a check that you can perform is, is to check to see if the omega-1 squared equals k1 over m1. Just, you found two numbers. You've got uh, up here, k1 is 113.7. m1 is 3.55. Take k1 over m1 and take its square root. So k1 over m1, that's about 30-something. Square root of 30-something is a little less than 6. Omega 1 is 5.65. And the same thing, omega 2 had better be equal to the square root of k2 over m2. So one, one of the things you can always do when you do your modal analysis, you do your calculations of u transpose mu, u transpose ku, if you calculate the ratios of each one of these things, you can go back and check and see the natural frequencies of the ones that you started with. And if, you have, if they are not, then you've messed up in your arithmetic. So now we've got our two independent equations and the natural frequencies check out. But we, haven't, uh, we, we still have a couple of things to deal with. We have to figure out how to calculate the initial conditions. And we have to figure out how to deal with damping. Let's do initial ICs first. So those of you who were here last time, I ended kind of right at the end. We kind of worked our way through figuring out the initial conditions for a two degree of freedom system, doing it the hard way. Ended up with four equations and four unknowns for the A1, A2, phi1, phi2. Remember that? I mean, it's really painful. There's a, this, is, this is incredibly easier. We're going to do the same thing, but extremely easily. So I, I would never go myself if given the choice of grinding out all those phase angles and amplitudes. I, by in simultaneous equations, I'd do the following. How, if I, generally now, I know the initial conditions are going to be specified not in Q coordinates, but in what coordinate system? In your original generalized coordinates, right? You're going to know you're going to X on this one. The general, if I'm going to set initial conditions here, I'm not going to say Q1 is equal to something. I'm going to say I'm going to put this one down one unit and this one down two units and let go. This is in x1 and x2 coordinates. 
But the beautiful thing here is that we know that x equals u q. So if I know the initial conditions on, I'll call it x naught here, if I know the initial deflections of the system, they're going to be u times the initial, value, the initial values of q. And if I know a vector of initial velocities at time 0, they're going to be u q0 dot. So if I told you values of x naught, and, and you know that this equation is true, what we need is q, the q naughts. We need the initial conditions in, in a modal coordinates in order to finish this problem. How would you get, if I told you this, how would you solve for that? Just a little linear, linear algebra here. Inverse matrix of u. Yeah, and do what with it? And you multiply x times. Multiplied by u inverse, right? OK, so this implies that q naught well, I better, I'll write it out a little more fully here. So if I do u inverse x naught, that's going to be equal to u inverse u q naught. u inverse times u gives you 1, basically, right? And so I have just. If I do u inverse x naught, I get q naught. That's all there is to it. Yeah. I, C's a problem. <laughs> okay, and I'm leaving it. I'm leaving it to the end. We're going to deal with it as the last step. And if I have initial velocities, u inverse times x initial velocities vector, I get the initial velocities vector in the natural coordinates. So that's how simple it is to get the initial conditions in modal coordinates. Boom. Okay. And we're going to we'll do a numerical example in a second here. We're looking for we're seeking a solution of the form to do initial to do uh, response to initial conditions. We seek equations that we know are right for a single degree of freedom system response to initial conditions. So we know that for a single degree of freedom system, x of t, this is for SDOF, for SDOF system here, x of t. we've worked out before is equal to some e to the minus zeta omega n t. This is just a transient decay problem of x naught cosine omega d t plus v naught plus zeta omega n x naught all over omega d sine omega dt, we know that that's what the response of a single degree of freedom system looks like to initial conditions x naught and v naught. And that for light damping, for small damping, you can off usually even ignore this term. So it's just, it's even simpler. This term is usually small compared to the, all right, small, this term, contribution from x naught is small compared to this term. So it's basically dominated by an x naught cosine and a v naught over omega d sine. But that's the re we know that's the exact response to a, for a single degree of freedom system to initial conditions. So just by analogy to that, we're looking for, for mode 1 in modal coordinates, it's going to look exactly the same way. e to the minus zeta omega n t q naught cosine 
omega 1 d, this is omega dt, plus q naught dot plus zeta 1 omega 1 q naught. I guess I need to do q 1 naught like that. This is the mo first modes equation, zeta 1, and I'll call this omega 1. But now they get multiple degree of freedom systems, you've got to keep track of what mode you're talking about. Mode 1, damping ratio mode 1, natural frequency mode 1, initial displacement mode 1, initial velocity mode 1, omega 1, d, like that. And mode 2 is going to be exactly analogous, q2 equals, and it's exactly similar, except you put a, update it with a 2 instead of a 1. And if you plug in the initial, you over here have found the initial values for Q1 and Q1 naught and Q2 naught and Q1 dot naught and so forth. You found the initial values that blow, go, plug into that equation by just doing this. And once we have this, then we can go back to saying, how do you get to the, get back to the final answer? Well, you just multiply the result for Q times the mode shape and add them up, and you have the answer. But we still have to deal with the damping problem. I'm going to do that one next. But I see a bunch of hands and some puzzled looks, so it means it's a good time to stop and talk for a second. Yeah. Pardon? What I can't quite hear it. The sine theta? I mean sine omega dt. Yeah, what about? Uh, why do we lose it? Do why do we use it? Lose it. Oh, you don't lose it. I was saying, see, this is this bit, it's like that. These are two pieces that behave like sine. And this, see, this one depends on initial displacement, but it's multiplied by the damping ratio. And the damping ratio for things that are interesting is usually pretty small. So here you have a term that's x naught cosine omega 1 <coughs> damped. And here you have a contribution that's x naught small times x naught sine omega 1, omega 1 damped. So you multiply the same, they're operating the same frequency. Two terms at the same frequency, you add them together, it's like a cosine omega t, t minus some phase angle. If this little term is small, that phase angle is almost zero. Cosine, x naught cosine plus something x naught sine. It gives you a, a, a cosine term that is shifted a little bit, and its that magnitude is different by this little amount. I'm just saying oftentimes this is small. But if you don't want to make that approximation, just carry it along. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Oh no! But I'm not throwing. I'm, I'm just saying you can take, you can throw out this piece usually, and it simply it makes. I keep in my mind. Vibrate. Let me, let me say, kind of vibration engineering is full of lots of approximations because it's very hard to get, to, oftentimes to get detailed quantitative numbers on exactly everything you need to know. So I carry around little approximations that I know is the way the world mostly behaves. And the way the world mostly behaves for a single degree of freedom system is the response to initial conditions looks like this. And this initial value here is always approximately x naught. And this initial slope here is always approximately, uh, tell you the slope is v naught. That's the slope. Now, it turns out that this thing is shifted just, it's shifted just slightly. Why? Because of this term. OK, but I honestly tell you the truth, it almost, it really rarely matters. So as a vibration engineer, I oftentimes just, I just remember I have an x dot cosine, I have a v naught over omega d sine, and the whole thing decays like that. But the, if you like to be mathematically precise, you carry along that little bit. Yeah. You're not going to lose a sign. Oh, 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 wait a minute. I just left it out. Ah, you guys are well. I'm glad you're awake. This is good. 
Now, yeah, how's that? Ah, good. Now I know why I had so many puzzled, puzzled looks. Anybody have a different question? Just anything now about this whole modal analysis thing? Because then we have to deal with this awkward part that has to do with the damping. And I got to finish on time. OK? The, um, all right. So damping, I've gotten this far. I ha what I need is I need estimates for the, for the damping for uh, mode one and damping for mode two, right? So the problem is that u, t, c, u does not always equal some nice diagonalized matrix. You sometimes get, these are not always 0. OK? It just, the orthogonality principle just doesn't apply to the damping terms. Just doesn't. And, but, doesn't act, but this actually doesn't hurt you a lot. You just got to know that this is going to be a problem. And when the systems are lightly damped, the approximation, even if you're the true damping in the system, gives you some non-zero elements here. The, the first order behavior of the system is basically going to be, you can just ignore the off-diagonal elements. What practical consequence do you think it has if these, if you have some actual non-zero numbers here? Go back and look at the equations that you were trying to derive. It's, these were the equations that we were trying to come up with. And we wanted them to be in individual single degree freedom systems. But if this has non-zero off-diagonal terms, you're going to find popping up in this single degree freedom equation another term that couples it through damping to the other modes. It provides a little bit of coupling to the other, to other modes. They can talk to one another. <coughs> All right? And what that means is if I, this is maybe a good time to do the, the, the demonstration. Um, Say this. If the initial displacement of the system is in the shape of one of the natural modes. So if this is some u, this is exactly shaped like mode r. So this looks like the u r vector. When I multiply it by this in, when I, when I multiply, when I carry out this multiplication, what do you think will happen? If this is shaped, if this is shaped like mode r, because of orthogonality, when I do u inverse, which is all about the mode shapes information, and the mode shapes are or, or these orthogonal set of in, independent orthogonal vectors. If this is exactly one mode, and I do u inverse times that, I will get 0 over here on the right-hand side for every mode except the mode that that's shaped like. So if this is shaped like a particular mode, then over here, all of the modal initial conditions are 0 except that mode. That means if I set this, give its initial conditions are equal to the shape exactly of mode 1, it only responds in mode 1. And if I give it, put it, give it initial conditions that are exactly equal to shape like that of mode 2, 
then it only responds in mode 2. And if I give it anything else, like I move just the top one but not the bottom, and let it go, then there's that one's, maybe I better do the other one. That one had too much of one, not the other. If I hold this one, here's its reference. I'm going to hold it right there, and I'm going to give this one a unit deflection and let go. Now you see you got some of both. All right? So if when I do this first one, say first mode, I could sit here and measure how many cycles it takes to decay halfway and estimate the damping ratio for that mode. If it's only moving in this mode, I can estimate its, I can estimate its damping directly for that mode and get zeta 1. You agree? OK. And if I did the same thing with mode 2, it's too fast for me to, make my, to catch it with a stopwatch. But I could measure its damping. And as it decays, I could get an estimate for zeta 2 for the damping ratio for mode 2. All right. All right. But somehow, I have to get damping ratio for mode 1, zeta 1, and damping ratio for mode 2, zeta 2. I have to somehow get it out of this. Um, I have to model it somehow with these damping coefficients that come from computing this U transpose CU. OK. So I'm going to, sh this is a, I'm going to show you a kind of damping called Rayleigh damping. Lord Rayleigh, who did lots of things in science that you've probably run into, um, proposed that if you let the damping, if you model your damping, the C matrix, as this is just now the system damping matrix that you start with, as some alpha times the mass matrix plus beta times the stiffness matrix. These are now the original ones of your, in your generalized coordinates, just your mass and stiffness matrices. If you model, if you say I'm going to approximate my damping model like this, then I want to compute U transpose CU. I'm going to get alpha u transpose m u plus beta u transpose k u. But we know that this gives you the diagonalized mass matrix. And this, known as the modal mass matrix, this gives you the diagonalized stiffness matrix. And so this damping model, this says, this is guaranteed to give you a diagonalized damping matrix which we'll call you know, somehow some capital C1, 0, 0, C2, right? And it's going to be alpha times the modal mass matrix plus a beta times the modal stiffness matrix. And these alphas and betas you adjust. They're just parameters you adjust to get the amount of damping you need, OK? So for a two degree of freedom system, C1 here is alpha M1 plus beta M, beta K2, K1, K1, excuse me. Modal mass, alpha times the modal mass plus beta times the modal stiffness. That's what you get for the first one. And C2 is alpha M2 plus beta K2. Okay. And the alphas and betas give you two free parameters you can play with. And for a two degree freedom system, I can manipulate alpha and beta to get the damping that I measure. 
and, I, and I've forced my equations of motion to uncouple. Now, Mother Nature may say, that, you, know, you know, Vandiver, they don't uncouple, and there's going to be a little crosstalk between them. But I say, yeah, but to first order, I under, it's, I'm going to get a pretty good model of the system. So let's do that in this case. Let's uh, maybe just to keep it. I've got numbers here, so let me find my notes. I don't get completely lost here. So I'll, I don't want, I'm going to just pick one for now. I'm going to model my damping with just beta k. Beta times my diagonal my stiffness matrix. And let's see, let's see what happens here. So that says my modal damping is going to be some, for mode one, will be beta k1. Now, what's damping ratio? Zeta 1 equals, for a single degree of freedom system, is the damping constant for the system over 2 omega 1 m1. But that's going to be beta k1 over 2 omega 1 m1. But m1 over k1 is omega 1 squared. So I get an omega 1 squared in the numerator. Beta omega 1 squared over 2 omega 1. Remember, the k over the m gave me the omega 1 squared, so the m's are gone. I can cancel one of these. This gives me beta omega 1 over 2. So this now gives me a way of I can fit one of the dampings. I can get exactly what I want, say, for mode 1, if I pick beta to be the right number. Okay, so in this case, I actually did, did some numbers. Pardon? Can't hear you. No. K1 over M1 is omega 1 squared. Omega 1 squared takes care of the M1. I get rid of one of the omega 1s. I'm left with this. Okay. Um, okay. So what if, so let's just let beta equals 0.01. And if you let beta equal to 0.01, then zeta 1 equals 0.01 omega 1 over 2. We know omega 1 is 5.65. Uh, this, when you work it out, then gives you a number of 0 0.0283, about 3%. And that would model, uh, that would say that this system, when it vibrates in mode one, is going to damp out up to 50% in about three cycles. Not bad approximations. I'm just guessing about what it is. That's a reasonable amount of damping for mode one. Now, the problem is when I only use just a beta k as my model, now I'm stuck with whatever happens for mode two once I pick beta, because zeta two is going to be beta omega 2 over 2. And omega 2 is quite a bit larger. So that makes oh, I'm stuck with a greater value for the second mode. In this case, it's uh, 0, 0885. So if I just pick a one parameter model for my damping, I'm, I can make one perfect, I can match it perfectly, but then I'm stuck with whatever the other one is. So I, I did this because I could do it simply with one. But if I'd kept the full model, a two-parameter model, I could actually, with manipulating both alpha and beta, I could actually model, get both of the two measured dampings exactly right. But if I have an n degree, if I have three degree of freedom system, I only have two parameters, I can fit two of the damping ratios, but then I'm going to be stuck with whatever it gives me for the third. But oftentimes, it's just one mode you really care about. It's the problem mode. You're at its natural frequency. It's going like crazy. Initial conditions make it vibrate a lot in that mode. 
But this is what Rayleigh damping allows you to do. It guarantees you that you will have a diagonal, diagonalized set of equations of motion. And it gives you two parameters that you can play with to fit the damping model however you want. Once you have damping, now you have the complete solution for decay from initial condition. And there's your two model. You can solve for Q1, transient decay given initial conditions. You can solve for Q2, transient decay of the second mode. And then to, to get back to the initial, to the response in terms of your modal coordinates, you just add the two together. Okay. Got some numbers here which are just instructive. Let's. Uh, U inverse. In order to get these initial conditions, you've got to know U inverse. Do we know U? I gave us U. Here's our mode shape, set of mode shape vectors. And I'm running out of boards. So we have the U matrix. We need U inverse. So U inverse for this problem. And we're going to quickly do some examples. Let's let uh, V, the V knots B0, no initial conditions on velocities. And let's do x not the initial displacements, B1 and 0. So the 1 and 0, what we're saying is the bottom one doesn't move, unit deflection here, let go. What are you, what are you going to get for the initial conditions? x not equals 1 and 0. Well, that implies that. The Q's are going to be U inverse X naught. So by the way, this, if this is true, this implies that all Q dot initial conditions equal zero, right? No initial velocities in generalized coordinates, no initial velocities in modal coordinates. But here we have, but we are going to have an initial deflection. And if I want to Multiple, I want to then compute u inverse x naught and see what I get. And what I get back when I do this one is 0 0.0898 and 0 0.9102. Remember, this is q1 naught, q2 naught. So for that case, it says I'm going to get 0.08 or 0.09 Q1 equal to Q1 and 0.9 of Q2. And my, I go back over here to my transient decay. There's no velocity. This is basically going to look like Q1, Q1 naught cosine omega d t e to the minus theta omega t, decaying cosine. But for mode one, its initial amplitude's you know, less than 0.1. And mode two, it's got a lot of mode two. So it is what happens. So we will unit deflection here. In fact, it's mostly mode two. And if I just quickly, I'll do one other. X naught is zero, one. That implies that Q, uh, Q naught that you get from that is 0 0.4016 and minus 0 0.4016. It says you get about equal amounts. So that's this one. I don't move this one, but I give this one a unit deflection. Let go. I get about equal amounts of each one. 
And of course, I've told you the answer to this one is if I let x equal mode one's mode shape, one and 2.266, that implies that q1 equals one and q2, when you multiply it out, is zero. So if I deflect it in the shape of mode one and I do u inverse x naught, I will get back zero and one. And if I make this the shape of mode two, I will get back zero for mode one and one for mode two. So that will, that's the uh, run out of time. But that's your intro to modal analysis. So I think it's conceptually powerful. That's Oh, is this one 0.08? Okay. I may have written that down. Yeah. I'll, ch I'll double check that. But yeah, question? Um, why is it for here that you think um, C to be only a function of uh, beta? beta? Okay. Because I wanted to get done by the end of the okay. 60, you know, 80 minutes. I could have put both of them in, manipulated both parameters. There's two equations, two unknowns, two target values of damping. I'd find an alpha and a beta that would make both work exactly right. It actually, just this one model is pretty good for this case. The damping for second mode is greater than the first mode just happens to be. This model's not bad. That's right, so you try all three and see what gets you the best results. Yeah.